I like scenes when a character looks in the mirror because it's that character essentially having a, a dialogue with themselves. It turned Hi. out not really to Hi, be necessary. Sarah. We get who How she is. Wait, There's right? enough information there about her life and her reality. And that's all that's required. Sarah Khanna. I don't remember offhand what the pressure was, if there was actual pressure to make the film shorter. I think there's always a sense that, you know, if it's, if it's not playing as well as it can, it will play better short. We shot that scene of him walking back to the car, and the, and the intention there was to show that he could commit cold-blooded murder in broad daylight on a suburban street, and he would walk out unconcernedly, not in a hurry, not like an animal running, not like typical criminal behavior, just walk out because he did not care. But it turned out not to be the best way to progress the story. I was very fascinated by those secondary characters, shot a whole bunch of stuff that we didn't use. It's not that the film was running too long, it's that we were taking too long getting to the point. We were creating a kind of suspended mystery, and we didn't start answering those questions until Sarah got into the car with Reese and he started going, this is the deal, we're from the future, there's a war, the machines are running the show. Until you get to that point, there are only so many questions and unfulfilled moments that the audience can juggle. In the interest of good storytelling, we had to get to that point as quickly as possible. Then after that, let it play out in whatever pace made the most sense. In the editing process, a film comes to life. It takes on its own life. And once it has that beating heart, it starts to make up its own rules. And you have to follow the rules of the film. And Terminator's internal rule set dictated that you put the throttle down to the firewall and you hold it down and you only back off when you need to to make a very specific dramatic point. We didn't want to back off for a character moment that wasn't based on the main characters. Once we learned that, it dictated what stayed and what went. That scene of Traxler dying and giving Reese the gun, which is the moment at which it's clear that Traxler has seen the future. He believes what Reese said. Is it important to the story that Traxler believe what Reese said right before he dies? No, it's not. It makes him a better character, but I don't think it improves the story. And probably that was the kind of decision-making process that went into removing that scene. I think one always attempts in the writing and then in working with actors to create some kind of point of connection, some kind of endearment. There's a lot going on there. I was intrigued by the idea that you could do a story where a character, the female character, had this support structure around her that was sort of as society dictates almost. She has a mother and she has a roommate. She has all of these things around her and they get stripped away one by one. And in the final hour, it's her fight. So she ultimately winds up naked against this almost inconceivable enemy and she has to find the resources within herself. And of course, once we see her do that, it creates a congruence with the image of the future that Reese has told her that she will become. It's absolutely great luck for me that I cut that scene because it became the nucleus of the entire second film. <laughs> so it gave us a reason to, to continue the story because there was that unfinished piece of business. The fact that we didn't deal with it, didn't have her make the cognitive leap that she had to be proactive and had to go after Cyberdyne and blow it up and try to change the future, actually gave us the whole second film. But what we lost there was Sarah becoming proactive and beginning to take on the mantle of leadership and seeing the kind of tactical mind that would be needed in the, in the future to fulfill her destiny, see it actually in progress, that transference of power, for him to drop back and her to step forward. And now the only time you see it is right at the end of the film. It's my molecular memory. Right. So they become hotshot computer guys, so they get to develop this thing for the government, right? Right, yeah, that's the way it was told to me. That's the beauty of it. You know, I got an infantryman who says, I didn't build the blanking thing. And I've got a waitress who can't pretend to, to understand the technology, and they're both having to deal with it. the war. There's nobody else. If we go to somebody official, we end up in jail again, and he's got us again. We've got to do it ourselves. That's not my mission. I think the statement that I was trying to make with Reese's characters is that they were living in a, in a very dehumanized future that had been thrust upon them. They had become like machines themselves in battling machines, and the, the classic idea that, that if you battle dragons, you become a dragon. And Reese had become a machine. He had become as cold and impersonal as a Terminator. And yet, a human being will always be fundamentally different, no matter how much they repress those emotions, bottle them up, or maybe even, in Reese's case, never have an opportunity to explore them. Still that human soul will be there. And that's the difference between us and the machine. And Reese could not be the cold machine that the Terminator can be. So 
I wanted to see that. I wanted to peel that onion. I wanted to crack that armor. I wanted to see the guy inside. We put Reese under unbelievable stress. He's been through stresses we can't imagine, being in this future combat his entire life, seeing his probably not even having friends, not even having close attachments because of the, the fact that they'll, they'll be lost. The, the attrition rate was just too high. His world is inconceivable to us, and yet our world's inconceivable to him. And the beauty of our world is what ultimately shatters his armor, which I, I like the irony of that. I think we felt that, that Reese kind of had two breakdown moments. One was the love scene in the, in the motel room, and the other one was the scene in the woods. And it seemed too many. Yeah. It's like a scene in a novel where you, you sort of reiterate the same point several times in different ways. It seemed like you did one or the other. Obviously, we needed the love scene because part of Sarah fulfilling her destiny was she had to give birth to John Connor. And the ellipse of Reese being the father was, was not something I was prepared to give up under any circumstances. And with that scene gone, you know, I think that the, the love scene in the motel room actually plays better. It has a more mythic quality. I'm not saying the scene doesn't work. It's just that when we modulated the, the pace of the storytelling on that film, it felt that it was a showstopper. You know, there are a lot of poetic aspirations in the film, and some of them were too much for the film, had they been done even perfectly. Some of them I didn't have the experience as a writer or as a director to do well. But I might have felt, you know what, I didn't get to express exactly what I wanted to express there, or maybe what I wanted to express didn't have a place in the overall story. And you know what? You're allowed to make those decisions as a, as a filmmaker, as long as they're not thrust upon you. That was a bait and switch for the audience, that there's going to be some sensitivity between them. Because, you know, you put a male and female together in a movie long enough in the same shot, and the audience is going to jump to the conclusion that they're eventually going to wind up together. Unless you either give them insurmountable obstacles, which I did by showing Reese as this kind of shut-down guy, or for whatever reason you do some kind of a plot twist where that, that doesn't take place. But they're going to make that inherent assumption just because they've seen so many movies, and it's like, okay, he's the guy, she's the girl, they're going to wind up together. So I wanted to sort of fake out the audience a little bit there where it's like, is this guy ever going to open up? It's about they can get together, but only if he reveals something of himself. All the things you've never seen and done. There's an attempt there on the part of the, of the writer to convey to the audience what it would feel like to be in a situation that where literally she moves from our reality into a new reality. Because she had no choice but to believe Reese, because the evidence was overwhelming, she then had to interpret everything she saw through a new filter. And that filter said that everything around her would cease to exist. But I think when she said, we're the only, we're the only three in the world, in a sense, that became her reality. They were the only three in the world. Nobody can help us even understand. You know, one hopes as a, as a filmmaker that, that you don't need to say it that the audience will get it, will draw that conclusion for themselves, and that's always better. People can get it at a level, even if they can't express it, articulate it, they can get it at some subconscious level. They may not know exactly why the, a film is appealing to them or making them think, but it's working. I would classify that scene as a clumsy attempt on the part of the writer to show that Reese had been brought back into the human race, but it was too much, too quick, it played goofy in the context, and it was an early uh, casualty of the editing process. <laughs> and no aspersion whatsoever on the part of the actors. I mean, I gave them permission to, you know, go for it, I think. But it was on the page, you know. She tickles him, he laughs. Then they hear the dog bark and had to go. The Cyberdyne ending where they find the chip and they find the hand that the, the Terminator's arm, the, the wreckage of the Terminator is still in the hydraulic press. So there is actual tangible evidence of some future technology here in the present. So we've laid that seed by the end of the film. I think that I would have loved to have kept that idea in the film, but, but you didn't need the scene at, at Cyberdyne where they find the chip. Because there was certainly, before the second film was released, people were trying to guess the story. And I heard many people say, well, there's still that that Terminator crushed there, they, they could build another one, or did they repair it, or something, you know, so people did remember that. Sometimes it's, it's the question you don't answer, or the thing you don't say, that gets the audience leaning forward into that state. 